Hello and welcome to the presentation. My name is Ray Walsh. The alternating quark model is a representational model of the structure of the atomic nucleus. The central premise is that up quarks and down quarks alternate in average positions and at regular intervals. The lightest nuclides through lithium-7 are shown here. The nucleus is typically presented as red and white spheres representing protons and neutrons, also shown here for comparison. Today's presentation will have two objectives. First, to introduce evidence that up and down quarks alternate at regular sequence within the nucleus. And secondly, to demonstrate the potential impact of quark structure on the fusion reaction. The structure of the atomic nucleus is directly relevant to nuclear fusion, but here we can, we can agree on two things. First, that despite billions of dollars and tremendous efforts of hundreds of capable scientists, there are currently no fusion reactors producing electricity on a commercial scale. Secondly, there are many theories of nuclear structure, but no general agreement on any one model. In lattice confinement, for instance, on the right, the various nuclei are represented simply as colored spheres, and hydrogen is a faint gaseous cloud in the lower right of the panel. Here we will show that the structure and orientation of the deuteron have a major impact on fusion reaction kinetics. Now the chemical elements are typically presented within a periodic table organized around electron orbital structure. This may be familiar to some of you. A second organizing principle of the periodic table is the trend in physical properties such as electronegativity. Here I will present a periodic table of nuclear structure that correlates with nuclear magnetic moments and the pattern of nucleon selection in single nucleon nucleosynthesis. Nuclides are typically presented within the Sager plot which is a plot of neutron number versus proton number. The plot highlights a trend in nuclear stability, initially linear through argon-36, then curving downward as nuclear stability is served by an increasing ratio of nucleons, neutrons. This presentation will focus on these first 33 stable nuclides. The equality of nucleon numbers could just be pure coincidence, but here we will show that the equality arises directly from the proposed alternating quark structures within protons and neutrons. The proton has two up quarks and a down quark in between. The neutron, two down quarks and an up quark in between. The exact positions and momenta of these quarks are uncertain, but the premise of the alternating quark model is that up and down quarks occupy average positions. These positions are set apart a distance equal to the radius of the proton, both within a nucleon and between nucleons. The premise that quarks alternate has physical consequences. First, alternating quarks lead to alternating nucleons. And secondly, alternating quarks produce equal numbers of protons and neutrons. These equal numbers of protons and neutrons explain the linearity of the Sager plot through argon-36. And if quarks alternate, quark charge must also alternate. Here we see the up quark is plus two-thirds and the down quark minus one-third. At this point I'd like to engage the audience in a thought experiment. We know that individual point charges will attract if the charges are opposite and repel if the two point charges are the same. But what about sequences of point charges? On the left we see a six charge sequence representing the deuteron. On the right a similar six quark charge sequence representing a second deuteron oriented anti-parallel to the first. The question I'd like you to contemplate in this moment is whether these two sequences will move together, will they be attracted, or will they be repelled and move apart? So take a moment, have a look at these sequences, and decide what you think they'll do.
All right, well, next I'd like to contemplate the same experiment, but this time the sequences are set right next to one another. In this instance, will the individual, uh, will the sequences attract one another? Will there be an attraction between the sequences, or will they repel? The result of this uh, experiment, the qualitative result, is that at a distance there's repulsion owing to the larger predominance of the up quark charge, which is twice the magnitude of the down quark charge. But in the short range, due to the alignment of opposite charges, there's a strong attraction. This is the qualitative result. We can verify this qualitative result quantitatively and generate a fusion potential curve. We can do this by setting up a 6 by 6 matrix calculation of the fusion potential. First we align uh, the vertical with the charges of one of the deuterons and the horizontal with the charges of the second deuteron. Matrix elements are then determined using Coulomb's law and the charges that intersect at that particular element, as well as the distance between the charges. The sum of these individual element charges produces a total force at 0 0.5 femtometer. We can do the same thing for a distance of 3 femtometers. Notice that the force of attraction is quite strong in the near range, minus 244 newtons. Well, at the far range, 3 femtometers, the force is uh, slightly smaller and is repulsive. So let's review the evidence for alternating quarks thus far. Alternating quarks leads to the observed roughly equal numbers of protein, protons and neutrons through argon-36. Alternating quarks generate a fusion potential curve and a Coulomb barrier. Now we will use uh, alternating quark structures to predict a near-perfect correlation with experimentally determined charge radii. So for lighter nuclides, a the formula for a regular polygon can be employed to predict the radius. Helium-4, for example, has 12 quarks predicting a dodecagon structure. If each quark occupies the vertex of the dodecagon, oct occupies a single vertex of the dodecagon, then we can use the formula of the regular polygon, having n, n equal 12 sides, with each side equal to a, the radius of the proton. The result is 1.63 femtometers, which is a 97% fit with the observed value of 1.68 femtometers. Larger structures conform to anisotropic cylindrical lattices of alternating nucleons, essentially stacked six nucleon rings. Occasionally these rings will include a, a neutron in the canal, and the rings are made of C12 kernels stacked one upon the other. The uppermost rings represent valence nucleons, which are the active site for nucleosynthesis. And although these uh, structures are depicted as protons and neutrons, the actual structures and the calculations of the radii were determined using alternating quarks. The net result is a near-perfect correlation of AQM radius predictions through argon-36. We can assemble these structures into a periodic table of nuclear structure. Protons and neutrons are shown here for ease of illustration, but again, each individual structure was used, was calculated using alternating quarks. The first number below each structure is the experimental radius. Below that in parentheses is the AQM predicted value. Below that is the spin, and the final number is the nuclear magnetic moment in bold. 
Group numbers are shown across the top, 0 through 11a. Periods are shown along the side. The group number corresponds to the number of valence uh, nucleons, as shown here in group 2. Each of these structures have two valence nucleons. And the same is true across all of the groups. Group uh, 11a is exactly the same as group 11 but contains neutron inclusions. Three of the elements depicted here actually don't occur naturally. Their structures were determined using the same set of parameters that determined the structures of the nuclides that do occur naturally. Common to all three of these uh, isobars is a lithium-6 structure. Now, Lithium-6 is a large 18-quark ring and is quite loose. So in this depiction, it appears as a, more of an oval rather than a circle. To illustrate why, I'm going to use a visual aid, my belt. Notice that the belt is a loose structure so that when lithium-6 rotates in space, it assumes more of an oval structure. The other implication of this loose oval is the possibility of node and anti-node vibration. It may be that this node-anti-node -node vibration causes the structures that contain an Li6 to be unstable, such as beryllium-8 fluorine 18 and phosphorus 30. Nuclear magnetic moments are shown again at the bottom of each block. Notice how when we transition from period 1 to period 2 the sign of the nuclear magnetic moment stays the same but decreases slightly. Same thing when we go from period 2 to period 3 in group 1. A similar trend is seen in group 3 from transition from period 1 to period 2, the sign stays the same, but the value decreases. Again, group 5, and also in group 11. Now, some of the more astute observers of this presentation will notice that I completely skipped over C13, N14, and N15. The reason is that these particular nuclides do not demonstrate periodicity. And the reason for it is interesting. I believe it may have to do with the manner of rotation. All of the structures in this periodic table of nuclear structure were determined with the assumption that um, the nucleus tumbles through space and that the distance, uh, the predicted radius, is the distance from the center of mass to the farthest quark. However, for these three nuclides, the best fit radius prediction happens if we assume uh, a uh, precessing rotation. So rather than tumbling like this pin, precession is spinning more like a top. Now, manner of rotation presumably affects the orbital angular momentum which is a major factor in the determination of the magnetic moment. So the fact that these three nuclides have a different manner of uh, rotating in space may account for their um, anomalous magnetic moments. Some of these structures also have a small purple arrow. This is uh, to highlight uh, the phenomenon of subluxation. These structures contain a C12, which is equivalent to the carbon-12 structure, two stacked six nucleon rings. And when we have two of them together, as in magnesium-25, the, the top C12 kernel has the capacity or ability to slide relative to the bottom, and this subluxation results in an elongation of the observed uh, uh, radius. A second periodic trend occurs uh, in single nucleon nucleosynthesis. 
Now this periodic table is set up identically to the one in the previous slide with group numbers across the top and periods across the side. Notice how individual nuclides, the series of stable nuclides, increases one nucleon at a time. This may appear to be somewhat of a random pattern, but there is a, uh, there is a pattern. For group 0, for instance, a neutron is added. Group 1, a proton. Group 3, a neutron. You can see the pattern across the table. Now, there are two exceptions. One is bor uh, transitions involving boron-10 and nitrogen-14. A second consequence of alternating quark sequences has to do with the steric selection of nucleon type during nucleosynthesis. The existing quark structure of beryllium-9 determines whether a proton or a neutron can be added to form the next stable nuclei. According to AQM, beryllium-9 has two terminal quarks, shown here in purple circles. If we add a proton, then the terminal quark of the proton must link with the terminal quark of beryllium-9 in order to propagate the alternating quark sequence. Here we can see that the proton and beryllium-9 link with opposite quarks thus propagating the alternating quark sequence. That's one steric factor. A second steric factor has to do with proton-neutron correlated pairs. The addition of a proton forms a correlated pair with a neutron on the existing base ring. If we attempt to add a neutron, which also has a terminal quark, we see that uh, this disrupts the alternating quark sequence. If we link these two terminal quarks, we'll have a down quark linked to a down quark, and this disrupts the alternating quark sequence, leading to unstable uh, beryllium-10, which is not shown. Thus, the existing quark structure of a nuclide sterically selects whether a proton or a neutron will, will add in order to form the next stable nuclide, and the process is analogous to base pair selection in the replication of DNA. Here are some more examples. Across the stop, top, we see the series of stable nuclides adding one nucleon at a time. If you look closely, you'll see that every nucleon that's added propagates the contiguous alternating quark sequence. In contrast, we see that the formation of carbon-14 actually disrupts the alternating quark sequence. There's a space there between the two nu nucleons on the top ring. The result is carbon-14, which is unstable and has a half-life of 5,700 years. Similarly, uh, when we add a proton to nitrogen-14, we form unstable oxygen-15. Now, in this case, adding either a proton or a neutron uh, can propagate the alternating quark sequence, but the neutron is favored owing to the coulombic repulsion between the proton and the nuclide nucleus. So the case for alternating quarks includes alternating quarks explain the linearity of the Sager plot through argon-36. Alternating quark charge produces a fusion potential curve in Coulomb barrier. The AQM radius predictions correlate near perfectly with experimental charge radii. AQM structures demonstrate shell-like periodicity as validated by periodicity of nuclear magnetic moments. And nucleosynthetic products containing contiguous alternating quark sequences are stable and those that don't are unstable. The result is quite a difference when we consider the impact of alternating quarks on the fusion reaction. The shape and orientation of a pair of fusing deuterons has a direct impact on the height of the Coulomb barrier. The anti-parallel approach requires less than half the potential of the axial approach. Here I'd like to leave you with a thought experiment. 
we know that the anti-parallel approach connects two terminal quarks and requires a potential of 0 0.36 mega electron volts. The axial approach is 0 0.83 mega electron volts, connecting only one terminal quark. With that in mind, what is the role of rotational kinetic energy?